good evening good afternoon good morning depending on whichever part of the world you are right now i am dr bc manoj president of national neonatology forum kerala and organizing chairperson of iap neocon it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar series aptly titled learn from the legends we have today with us professor dr ola soxted one of the leading legends of neonatology who will inaugurate this series with his talk on oxygenation of the newborn welcome sir and to moderate this session let me welcome two special persons dr nandakishor kabra president and dr nabin bajaj secretary of iap neonatology chapter india before i hand over the floor to them may i also welcome each and every one of you we are humbled by your presence in fact we are thrilled to have more than 1200 delegates from 24 countries for the series thank you friends for having joined the webinar series which will run in the next 15 months as a curtain raiser for our national conference iap neocon uh, scheduled in september 2021 we hope you find all our sessions productive and useful in day to day practice of neonatology may i now request dr nandakishor kabra and dr navin bajaj to take over introduce our speaker and moderate the session thank you good evening everybody dear friends i extend a very welcome very warm welcome to you all on behalf of iap neonatology chapter over the years iap neonatology chapter is at the forefront of promoting evidence based neonatology this year we were supposed to host iap neocon 2020 in trishur in october with pre uh, prevailing global pandemic we decided to cancel this conference and conduct it in 2021 to fulfill the vacuum we are conducting a series of webinars in collaboration with nnf kerala dr manoj and his team have done a wonderful work of putting a scientific program entitled learn from legends to deliver the first webinar we were fortunate to have a globally renowned a legendary neonatologist from norway professor dr ola sokstad as the first speaker we are very fortunate to and privileged to have you sir today i request my colleague dr navin bajaj to carry over with the further proceedings thank you good evening friends i feel very honored to invite dr professor ola sokstad he is professor of pediatrics he is a director also of neonatology perinatal division in oslo university norway you must have heard his name before many times especially for his path breaking at the research on room air versus 100% oxygen during resuscitation which has changed the practice of resuscitating a term newborn at birth with room air rather than with oxygen he has almost 500 publication to his contribution across many international journals he has received more than 20 awards and almost every country uh, in the world has awarded him and i could name one of the award which i felt very exciting is he is knighted by the norwegian king saint olaf's order for pediatric research in 2010 right sir uh, i hope i have uh, i have read correctly he is member of six international societies and we are honored to have him with our in our inaugural webinar sessions his lecture will be about 45 to 50 minutes and uh, after the lecture we will have a question answer session and i request all the delegates to post the question in the q and a box which is just below the screen in in q and a section and we will club the question and then we will discuss it at the end of the webinar thank you now the stage is handed over to dr professor ola sokser sir please well uh, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic uh, introduction by dr kabra and dr bajai uh, and i also would like to thank uh, dr manjo for um, inviting me to this uh, uh, fantastic uh, webinar is really a, a pleasure and an honor to to give this speech and um, as some of you know i i visited uh, uh, new delhi uh, delhi 
uh, in March, just before the, the lockdown. And I had a great time there. And, and I have many friends in India, as you know. So um, with these words, I will see if I'm able to find my presentation. Here it is. And uh, yeah. So uh, I think it is. I hope that you can uh, <clears throat> see me and um, hear me clearly. And it's, of course, for me, it's a great pleasure to talk about uh, oxygenation of the newborn, which is a topic I have been uh, interested in for more than 40 years. Um, let's see now. <clears throat> uh, here, here it goes. So here is the outline of uh, my lecture, which will last uh, 45 minutes plus, uh, I guess. Uh, and I will, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I will start out with uh, uh, giving a few comments about oxygen and oxygen toxicity. And then I will go through the uh, history and the, and the present uh, status. Uh, for newborn gestation and oxygen. And uh, also discuss with you which oxygen saturation targets we should aim at after birth for the different um, gestational ages. And uh, <clears throat> at the end of my lecture, I will uh, also say a few words about the neoprom studies, how we should oxygenate immature infants beyond the delivery room. And if time permits, a few words about epigenetic changes uh, of oxygen therapy. For those of you who are uh, interested in the, this uh, topic, uh, uh, I have, together with my collaborators, uh, recently published uh, a few articles. Uh, you can find them here. And I'd like to draw your attention to the April issue of Seminars in Fetal and Neonatal Medicine, which is wholly um, devoted to this topic, oxygenation of the newborn. There are lots of excellent articles <clears throat> in that uh, issue of seminars. So <clears throat> what are the goals of oxygen therapy of the newborn? I tried to summarize that in four points. And, and first of all, it's it's of course to provide sufficient oxygen to the tissues and avoid anaerobic metabolism. We also want to prevent hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, promote brain and somatic growth. And for uh, neonatologists, uh, it's very important to minimize adverse effects. And I think that every neonatologist knows that. They know about the dichotomy of oxygen. The oxygen is, of course, critical to life, but it can also induce oxidative stress, injury to a number of organs, as the lungs, um, contributing to bronchopulmonary dysplasia, retinopathy of prematurity, brain damage, impaired brain development, and also damage to a number of other organs as the heart and kidney. So <clears throat> a few words about the, the role of oxygen in the metabolism. And um, if you go back and do your biochemistry course uh, lessons in, in medical school, I'm sure you remember that uh, uh, oxygen has a fundamental role in, in in the cellular respiration. And this starts with the breakdown of food, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids into acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA enters the citric cycle, the Krebs cycle, as you can see here. And what is the, what is the purpose of this Krebs cycle, or the citric acid cycle? Well, it is to reduce NADH plus an FADA, and in that way they, it carries electrons. Uh, this is a redox process and carries electrons to the last stage of the cellular respiration, the electron 
transport system. So here's a close up of this system. And the electron transport chain consists of five complexes, as shown here, and they are situated on the inner mitochondrial membrane. So when electron, electrons are transported from the cytic acid cycle by NADH and, and reduced FAD, FAD, electrons are donated and they are transferred from one complex to the next. At the same time, protons are pumped across the membrane. In that way, it is generating a gradient, and this gradient can be used to produce ATP. Now, what is the role of oxygen? Well, it is to accept the electrons here. And if protons are available, water is uh, um, generated. So oxygen's, the role of oxygen is to be an electron acceptor. Now, not all the electrons uh, go from one complex to the other. Some of them will leak out here and generate reactive oxygen species. But fortunately, the body has uh, defense systems which can neutralize these um, during normoxia. And I'm sure you all know the most important antioxidants are superoxide dismutase, glutathione, catalase, and there are a number of others also. So what happens in hyperoxia? Well, there is a larger leak of electrons. As you can see here, more reactive oxygen species are generated and which may overwhelm the defense systems leading to oxidative stress. At the same time, hyperoxia results in a lower production of ATP. I will show you some data at the end of my lecture demonstrating why this happens. So reactive oxygen species, they attack uh, a number of biological molecules as DNA, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates. I will not go into details with that. My interest in uh, this uh, topic was uh, raised more than 40 years ago. I started, in fact, my research uh, measuring this substance here, hypersantin, which is a breakdown product from ATP. It's a, it's a purine. And when hypersantin, in the presence of santin oxidase, is oxidized to uric acid, some free radicals, superoxide radicals, are generated. At the same time, we measured how hypersantin increases in the blood during resuscitation. This is from um, animal studies, but you can still see that there is a, well, the point, I don't get the point of working now, but you see this line here, it's an exponential increase in hypersantin. So I was starting to think that, okay, in a situation where you generate a lot of superoxide radicals, perhaps you should be careful giving oxygen because then you will generate more oxygen-free radicals. And that's how I started to think that perhaps we should not give supplementary, supplementary oxygen during resuscitation. So how much oxygen should we give during resuscitation? So let's look at uh, the evidence. If we, we start, with, if we go back to Virginia Apgar, she published her Apgar score in 1953. And at that time, she and her colleagues, they were very liberal uh, using oxygen. So 20% approximately of her uh, enrolled babies uh, were given oxygen by some method as shown here. And in order to achieve a, a high APCO score, nine or 10, the baby has to be pink, as you know. But in order to get a newly born baby pink, is only one way to do that, and that is to give oxygen. So for many years in many parts of the 
the world, I don't know how it was in India, but it was standard care to give a dash of oxen to every newborn baby, to pink them up so APCA score was became higher. But we know that this is not physiological because in fetal life, there is a relative hypoxemia, the baby is born cyanotic, and during the normal transition, pulmonary hypertension resolves, there's a gradual improvement in oxygen saturation. So cyanosis is normal during fetal life and for the first few minutes after birth. And it is a question whether a normal, a healthy newborn baby at one minute or even five minutes is able to achieve an APCA score of nine or 10. If you look here, how the saturation develops the first 15 minutes after birth, you see here is the preductal saturation. And at two minutes, the, the mean value is just above 70. And you see there's a wide variation here. So many of these babies are cyanotic and very few are pink, if any, probably not, none of them are pink. Even at five minutes, you see here, many babies have a saturation less than 80%. So <clears throat> what happens if you give 100% oxygen to these babies? I guess the same happens, or we know that the same happens as in animal studies. This is from a, a study by Linner and coworkers from Sweden where they resuscitated newborn lambs after cardiac arrest. They induced cardiac arrest by clamping the, the cord, and then they randomized the animals to be resuscitated with 100% toxin, the red line, or rumor, the blue line. And you see here what happens if you give 100% oxygen, you get a very high PO2. A contrast, if you give 21% uh, oxygen, you see this slow increase uh, reaching physiological levels within a couple of minutes. Even in the brain, we have this peak in uh, uh, PO2 as shown here, and also the saturation in the brain increases with 100% oxygen. Uh, even a, a very brief uh, exposure to 100% oxygen leads to a, a high PO2 peak in the brain and also high saturation. So, <clears throat> This is how the, the world map looked like before 1998. Um, I'm sorry I didn't put in India here. I was not quite sure about uh, um, how the practice was um, at that time. But the idea is that all the, as far as the I know, all the um, recommendation for newborn recitation at that time recommended to use 100% oxygen for newborns in need of resuscitation. What happened in 1998? Well, the so-called the RESER2 study was published where we had randomized more than 600 babies uh, in need of resuscitation to either air or 100% oxygen. And we were able to show that uh, the babies who were given air uh, did as good as those who received 100% oxygen. So WHO, they changed, they came out with new guidelines in 1998, and they, as the first, <clears throat> um, suggested that we could start with air in, in most babies. So before 1998, uh, newborn babies needing recitation uh, when oxygen was at hand, had to go through this PO2 peak here. Now, so what happened um, during the next years, so during approximately almost 20 years, uh, there were 10 studies examining how, uh, whether newborn could be resuscitated with air or 100% oxygen. The first study was the study by Siddharth Ramji and coworkers. This was a study this was our pilot study, which was carried out in, in New Delhi, Delhi, Maulana Asad Medical College. And we were able to show that it is possible to use air. So Siddharth was very brave uh, when he and his staff uh, did this study 
and it was published in 1993. And then the RESET-2 study came out in 1998. And, um, and then Sita Ramji had a new study and then one of our chairpersons, uh, Dr. Baja, had uh, published his study in 2005. Uh, so when we did a meta-analysis of all these 10 studies, including more than 2,000 babies, we showed that there was a 30% reduction in mortality when you resuscitated with air compared with 100% oxygen. So the world map started to change. And the first country which changed from oxygen to, to air was Canada. And uh, that was in 2006. And then Australia came some years later. I think uh, India at that time switched to 40%. I'm not sure, probably different practices, this huge um, country. Russia was also one of the first to switching to air. Finland, Sweden, the Netherlands, UK, Spain, all switched to air. So the, the world was divided. Some babies still got this PO2 peak and some got a more physiological approach when needing recitation. Now in 2010, the world changed because ILCOR changed their recommendations. And they stated that in term infants receiving recitation at birth, with positive pressure ventilation, it is best to begin with air rather than 100% oxygen. So slowly or gradually, the world map changed even more. And uh, I think all guidelines after 2010 now recommend to start with air for term or near term babies. So now babies who are in need of recitation get this more physiological approach uh, as shown here. So to summarize uh, some of the basic biochemistry behind that, I, I started to measure hypoxanthin. I realized that hypoxanthin is a free radical generator. So when you give oxygen, 100% oxygen, that is translated into higher mortality than if you give room air. And we found that mortality was decreased from 12.8 to 8.2%. It was a 30% reduction. Corresponds to potentially 200,000 saved lives every year uh, in this world just by avoiding 100% oxygen. So, <clears throat> try to illustrate this. Um, so, if you resuscitate with PO, uh, with um, room air PO2 slowly normalizes and uh, reaches a physiological level after a few minutes. Some free radicals are generated. However, if you give 100% oxygen, you get this enormous peak here, and you also get the tsunami, I call it a tsunami, this wave of free radicals, which may injure the newborn. And in fact, today we know that this has a number of effects on the baby. It leads to cerebral vas constriction, brain inflammation, pulmonary vascular reactivity increases, and it may injure the heart and also the kidney. And hyperoxia in the delivery room, the first 10 minutes of life is also associated with significantly more childhood leukemia. Now, after this and after the change, there was no more meta-analysis until last year, where Wellsford and co-workers published this meta-analysis published in pediatrics uh, from the ILCOR group. And here we have uh, their short-term mortality in term newborn babies. And as you can see, they also could confirm that there is approximately 30% reduction in mortality if a baby has been given air compared with 100% oxygen. And these authors, they, they stated that there will unlikely be any further studies on this topic. Now, you know, you can never be sure uh, what is true today in medicine could be wrong tomorrow. So we have to be open that at least there might be groups among term 
near-term babies who would need some extra oxygen. Well, these authors also looked at uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, grade two and three. And um, you see there's not many studies, but most of them are from, from Ramji, myself, Ramji again, and Bajai. And then there's one from Romania, and there's no, no um, FO2 for those who survive. And when they looked at long-term outcome, the only two studies is uh, uh, my own study and uh, our chairperson, chairman, Dr. Bajai study. Uh, so we don't have many babies, but there was no difference. Uh, and unfortunately, we would like to have more follow-up uh, data on this topic, but I guess it's very difficult to get more data today because nobody will run a randomized study anymore with 100% oxygen, for instance, in term babies. So term babies, yes, we start with air because it reduces brain inflammation and perhaps hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Mortality is decreased and cardiac injury and also pulmonary hypertension. Renal injury is also reduced and also the risk of leukemia. So that was term babies. What about preterm babies? We know that the preterm babies are different from term babies. Um, every neonatologist know that. They react differently to hypoxia. They go directly to bradycardia, increase the risk of interventricular hemorrhage. They have an immature respiratory center, and they have a reduced defense against oxidative stress. Also, mask leak might be a problem when they're ventilated. We know also that the thoracic cage structure is different. It's soft, the weak muscles here, and there's also an impaired alveolar capillary interface, impaired pulmonary vascular response to oxygen, of course, also surfactant deficiency is part of this uh, picture. Now in 2010, Ilkor stated for preterm babies, less than 32 weeks, that these, these babies will not reach target saturations in air. So blended oxygen and air may be given judiciously and ideally guided by pulse oximetry. Now Ilkor didn't say anything about which FiO2 we should start with. And they didn't say anything about target saturations. However, in 2015, the next, <coughs> the next, <coughs> excuse me, the next recommendations uh, were more specific. First of all, they said that um, babies less than 35 weeks of gestation uh, one should avoid high supplementary oxygen concentration, which means avoid about 65% or, 65 or above. And now they also recommend uh, FiO2 to start out with 21 to 30% oxygen. Here, is the, here, here are the European recommendations uh, that came out uh, last year. Uh, for babies with RDS. And uh, it says that oxygen should be controlled by using a blender. And initial FO2 of 30% is appropriate for babies less than 28 weeks and 21 to 30% for those between 28 and 31 weeks. Adjustments should be performed guided by pulse oximetry. So let's um, take a look at the evidence for these uh, recommendations. One important question when we're talking about preterm babies is, of course, should we start high and titrate down, or should we start low and titrate up? Well, this is one of the first studies uh, published. It's from Max Ventus Group, where they randomized babies uh, less than 29 weeks to start <clears throat> a recitation with either 90% oxygen or 30% oxygen. And what you can see here, the saturation didn't differ between the two groups. That was surprising, I think. But the reason, I think, for that 
was that uh, uh, FiO2 was adjusted very quickly. So within four or five minutes, there was no difference between those who started high or those who started low. And there was no difference, uh, no significant difference in heart rate, which was reassuring. In spite of this very brief hyperoxic exposure to these babies, uh, Max Vento and his colleague could show that these babies in the 90% group, they had significantly more oxidative stress and even inflammation for days after the recitation. So just a few minutes exposure to hyperoxia in the delivery room seems to trigger long-term effects in these babies. So it was clear that uh, some larger randomized studies were needed. And one of these studies, or actually the largest to date was the torpedo trial from Australia, Sydney, uh, where Julie Owe uh, organized that in Sydney. And I was so uh, fortunate I was uh, invited to participate in this study. So in the torpedo trial, infants less than 32 weeks were randomized to air or 100% oxygen. And we didn't find any difference in mortality when you looked at the whole cohort, all babies. However, when we did a post hoc analysis of babies less than 28 weeks, to our surprise, and I would say also to our concern, we saw that mortality was significantly higher for those who had been started with air compared to Hanpin's oxygen. Relative risk almost fourfold increased. We also looked at um, uh, the relation uh, or association between the five minute saturation and the primary outcome, which was death and or disability. And what we could find, what we could show was that those babies who reached a saturation of 80% within five minutes had a 50% reduction in primary outcome. And this was uh, quite a new finding when we published that uh, three years ago now. So I'll come back to that, uh, the significance of reaching a saturation of 80% within five minutes. But we, we felt it was important to carry out some uh, reviews and meta-analysis of all the studies that have been carried out. So we looked at all studies including preterm babies, and uh, uh, where babies have been resuscitated with either high or low FiO2. High FiO2 is defined as 60 to 100 percent oxygen, and low 21 to 30 percent. So here is the flow diagram. I have not spent time on that. It was this was published in archives four years ago now. But what we found was that there was no difference in death mortality, whether you started high or low. But what we found was that in mass studies, it was an advantage to start low with 21 to 30 percent oxygen. It was lower mortality, as shown here. But we found the opposite in unmass studies. So this is a little bit confusing, and I think we need more studies. And I'll come back to that because we are planning a new study. So then I will continue with uh, how saturation, oxygen saturation should develop um, the first minutes after birth. So this is a cartoon uh, Max Vento and I published uh, 10 years ago now, where we show how the saturation develops in babies less than 29 weeks. And we have the standard, two standard deviations. And here we have uh, the mean values, and you see that it uh, saturation increases uh, slowly the first uh, five, ten minutes of life and reaching a plateau. But it's not as easy as that because it also depend the saturation depends on whether you're using CPAP or not. So if you are ventilating the babies with a PEEP, um, the saturation increases faster than if you're not having any PEEP. And there's also a difference between genders. So 
So girls have a more rapid increase in saturation than, than boys. And, and the reason for that is probably that uh, b uh, girls are more mature than boys. Uh, so they have more mature lungs. Well, it seems also that when we clamp the cord is of importance for how the saturation develops. So if you do a late clamping, the saturation is higher the first minutes of life as shown here by, by this group of uh, investigators and these data are from Nepal. So what we did, we, we had a cohort of more than 700 babies, less than 32 weeks who had been resuscitated with different FIO2s initially. So 21%, 30%, 60 to 65% or 100%. So we divided these babies into gestation age less than 29 weeks or 29 weeks up to 32 weeks. So this is what we found for babies less more than 29 weeks regarding development of saturation. The shader, here we have the minutes as you see here up to 10 minutes and here we have the y-axis we have saturation. And the gray shaded area is the targets recommended by American Heart Association and the circles are targets recommended by the European Resuscitation Council. Now these recommendations are not uh, evidence-based but it's a, the, probably the best guess. And what we see here is that for all the groups, except for those who received ear, oops, um, target was reached. Uh, and for those who received ear, it took five, six minutes to be within the, the target of American Heart Association. Now for babies less than 29 weeks, all the groups, except for those who received initially 90 to 100%, percent and here we have 60 65 percent and here in the target we have 90 to 100 percent it takes seven eight minutes to reach target now we don't know if this is uh, good or bad but it's uh, i think it's an interesting observation anyway we are now at a stage that we can recommend uh, some targets the first few minutes after birth, although we don't know what is the optimal. For instance, um, um, for instance, um, this um, case story from uh, Rich Wade and Neil Feiner, they have defined the target uh, as being between the 10th and the 50th percentile of the Dawson curves. And you see here is a baby which is within the target. It's pretty, here is exceeding the target a little bit. But here's another example showing how difficult it might be to be within the target. So here is a, a baby above the target at uh, 90 seconds of age approximately. So the FO2 is turned down 10% from 40 to 30%. And then you see the baby's within the target here for some seconds, but then it's under target. FO2 is increased 10%, still under target, increased another 10%, and then the baby is more or less within the target, the rest of the observation. This is from a, a Dutch study, again, showing how difficult it is to, to reach the target. Uh, so here we have the saturation, and here we have the target, here we have the variation, and here the black line here is the median. And you see that the median, most of the babies were under target the first four or five minutes. And you see this scatter. It's, it tells us, and everybody who has been trying to reach a target in the delivery room knows how difficult it is. So what is the impact of the five minute uh, saturation? Well. We, we were able to show that uh, primary outcome was uh, reduced 50% in those babies who had a saturation of 80% or more within five minutes. 
And when we did follow up on these uh, babies, we found there was a five or more than a five point increase in cognitive score for those babies who had reached saturation of 80% within five minutes. Now, we don't know if this is because of the saturation or that those who were sicker in the first place had problems reaching a saturation. But still, I think this is an important observation. In addition, we could um, demonstrate that there was higher mortality in those babies who didn't reach saturation of 80% within five minutes, and also more severe interventricular hemorrhage, grade three and four, as you can see here. There's no effect on BPD. So again, the question, should we start low and titrate up if needed? Well, this is a very hot topic and this question, a very important question to answer, but it's not easy to answer that question, in my opinion. This is a study from Austria um, showing how saturation uh, develops in those who reach a saturation of 80%. These do not, and the upper line here, those who reach the saturation of 80% within five minutes. You see the first two, three minutes, there's not a big difference between saturation. We cannot use the saturation at, let's say, age two or three minutes to, to kind of identify those who do not reach the saturation of 80% within five minutes. So it means we have only a very few minutes, maybe one minute or two minutes to decide whether we should uh, increase the FO2 or not. And if you look at the FO2, the first minutes of life between those who reach the saturation of 80 and those who did not, the upper line, they reach the saturation of 80 and those who did not, and you see that FO2 is not different. I mean, if you're standing there and you see that it's not very much difference, this is at four minutes, it means that we have not much time to decide whether we should increase FO2 or not. So for that reason, some people will say that it's better to start high and tighten it down. And another argument for that came from a study published by Stuart Hooper and Arjen Tapas and I'll show you some of their animal data uh, because they exposed very immature rabbit kittens to nine days gestation to air or oxygen. What you can see here, the red uh, symbols here uh, represent the breeding rate for those who were exposed to air. And when they switched to oxygen, breeding rate increased. They also measured the time the glottis was open. And you see that Glottis opens uh, more when you, you give oxygen compared with air. So it seems that immature infants may, in order to open the glottis, need some extra oxygen. Maybe that's the reason that uh, the torpedo ba babies less than 28 weeks who were randomized to air had a higher mortality. In case, I would argue that if we give them some extra oxygen, it should be as low and brief as possible because we don't know what is the optimal for these babies. So before I go on, I would like to remind you why oxygen is so toxic uh, to newborns. They have a reduced protection of oxidative stress. Oxidative phosphorylation is reduced. I'll show you these data in a minute. There's infl increased inflammation, and we and others have shown that DNA protection and repair are downregulated in hyperoxia. Cell growth is also affected. This is a study published more than 10 years ago from Koch and his group in Dallas, Texas. I, I want to show you some of these data because I think they're so dramatic. What I did was that they had newborn mice and they, they induced uh, cerebral asphyxia or hypoxia there by unilateral carotid ligation and letting them breathe 8% oxygen for 30 minutes. And then they resuscitate with air or 100% oxygen, different uh, 
time periods, 15, 30, 60, et cetera, minutes. So, so what I found in animals resuscitated or given pure oxygen was severe injury, large cortical infarcts, extensive necrosis compared to those who received air. It was very dramatic differences. Seems that oxygen is kind of burning, it's frying the brain. What we did in a newborn mice, a newborn mice model, a hypoxic newborn mice model, we, we reoxygenate them with different oxygen concentrations, air, 60, 40%, 60%, 100% oxygen. I'll show you some of the data. And what we found was that oxidative phosphorylation was down-regulated in, in the brain of animals resuscitated with 60 or 100% oxygen. So here we have the, um, the five complexes of oxidative phosphorylation again. And what we found was that genes in all these five complexes were down-regulated by 60 and or 100% oxygen. We also shown in a piglet study that if you resuscitate with 100% oxygen compared with air, um, oxidative phosphorylation seems to be uh, down-regulated. So this is maybe the reason why there is a higher mortality when you resuscitate with 100% oxygen. So I think it's important to remind us about that, the fact that supplemental oxygen, even very brief, few minutes, leads to increased oxidative stress, inflammation, genomic changes, reduced DNA, DNA repair and cell growth inhibition. We also have shown epigenetic changes. I will show those data in a few minutes. On the other hand, it seems that oxygen may be needed in most immature infants. But in case I, it's my opinion, is that it should be given as low and as brief as possible. So we should start low and tighten it up according to saturation and clinical response, which is, for instance, heart rate. Not everybody agrees with me in that. And I think this is a, an important issue to study and to discuss in the next future. So we need more studies and we are planning a new torpedo trial, torpedo 3060, where we want to randomize babies less than 28 weeks or 29 weeks to 30 or 60% initial oxygen. For those who are interested in joining, uh, we, are still, um, we still want uh, units to join. So you can contact Rebecca Brown or contact me. Uh, so please do that. And then a few words about the Neoprom study, how we should oxygenate immature babies beyond the delivery room. So the question asked uh, for the Neoprom trials was the following. What is the optimal target saturation for preterm neonates that would result in the lowest death and neurodisability? And as you know, there are five studies. Uh, part of the Neoprom study is the support trial from USA, the COT trial from Canada, and then there were three boost trials, one from UK, one from Australia, and one from New Zealand. So in these trials, babies less than 28 weeks were randomized for 48 or 24 hours to reach two saturation targets, either a low saturation target, 85 to 89, or a high saturation target, 91 to 95%. So in the low saturation target, there was more necrotizing encolitis and mortality, and in the high saturation target, more ROP. So the result of these uh, this, uh, studies was that uh, the guidelines have changed. For instance, in 2010, the European guidelines stated that in babies receiving oxygen, saturation should be ma maintained between 85 to 93 percent. In uh, 2017, or in uh, the European guidelines changed to um, targets between 1994 and the US 1995. Here I have summarized some of the 
meta-analysis carried out on the Neoprom data. And what you see here is that mortality is increased approximately 18% in the low saturation target. No difference in neurodevelopmental impairment, but ROP is reduced in the low saturation group, 25% approximately. No effect on interventricular hemorrhage or BPD. Necrotized anticholitis is increased 25% in the low saturation target babies. So here I have looked at the risk difference between high and low saturation uh, babies. And so I summarized all the data and everything above zero here means that it favors a high saturation target and under it favorites low saturation targets. And the numbers here are p-values. So here you see death is significantly increased in low saturation target, necrotizing anticholitis as well, ROP benefits from low saturation targets, also BPD, but not if you look at the physiological BPD, apparently. Now, so after this, I mentioned that the recommendations have shifted to higher saturation targets, for instance, 1995 or 91 to 95 or 1994. And there has been concern that ROP will increase. And this was a report from Western Sweden some years ago, actually saying that, that there is more ROP after targets were increased. Now, as far as I know, there has not been reported more blindness, but still, of course, this is, uh, might be concerning. Here's a very new study from um, uh, Oren and coworkers from, uh, I think it's the support um, trial, where they did a six, seven years uh, follow-up of babies who have been assigned to a low or a high saturation target. And they looked at blood pressure at this at school age. So here we have the characteristics of the babies, 800 plus grams, 26 weeks plus. But here they found that physiological BPD was reduced in the low saturation group. When it comes to blood pressure, there was absolutely no difference whether you had been nursed in a low saturation group or a high saturation group. So this is, of course, important data, but we need longer follow-up of these babies. And I'm sure we'll get uh, more follow-up data in the years to come. And finally, just a few words about um, epigen epigenetic changes in bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is a cartoon from Max Ventus group uh, recently published showing how, how a number of conditions in uh, utero or, or after birth, which leads to the need of oxygen therapy and then to hyperoxia, reactive oxygen species production. And it seems that these also may lead to epigenetic changes, DNA methylation or histone modification. I will end up with showing some of our most recent results in newborn mice lungs. We kind of uh, developed a BPD model in newborn mice. We randomized newborn mice to 85% oxygen for 14 days, and they developed BPD-like picture. And we had controls in room air for 14 days. Mm -hmm. So here we see the pups here. And uh, what we found was that thousands of genes in the hyperoxia mice had DNA hypermethylation. And especially in the TGF beta pathway, we found methylation. Well, this is just to show that uh, we get the BPD like uh, histological picture uh, when the animals have been exposed to two weeks of hyperoxia. And here we have this uh, diagram sh showing uh, the difference between hyperoxia and normoxia. And you don't need to be an expert to see the, the dramatic differences here in, in uh, methylation between normoxia and hyperoxia. 
So we know that transforming growth factor beta, TGF beta, super family members are key regulators for lung development and also are important for development of BPD. So these results, they indicate that hyperoxia increases methylation of important genes uh, of the TGF beta pathway. So to end up, oxygen targets um, between 91 to 95% in babies less than 28 weeks increase ROP in need of therapy. But fortunately, not, no severe vision injury uh, has been shown. It's not been increased uh, uh, severe vision injury or blindness with the high saturation targets. Oxygen targets between 85 and 89% increase mortality and necrotizing enterocolitis. And for long-term follow-up, there was no differences between the arms regarding death, disability, blindness, hearing loss, and now recently also blood pressure. Hyperoxia may lead to epigenetic changes in the lung. We don't know whether these are transient or long lasting. This is important to find out. So how can we individualize oxygen therapy for newborns? Well, we can at least individualize more than we did some years ago in the delivery room, about 31 weeks. Start with air, between 28 and 31 weeks, start with air or 30% oxygen as recommended by ILCOR. Less than 28 weeks, start with 30% oxygen. And I have to underline, we don't know what is the optimal initial FO2 for these babies. For all gestational ages, adjust according to saturation if you have a pulse oximetry or pulse oximeter available. And I would argue for, for starting low and tight it up. We need more studies to test the significance of saturation above 80% versus under 80% at five minutes of age. It is difficult to do randomized studies in, in this field. We also have to adjust for gender, CPAP, cord clamping. For babies beyond delivery room, less than 28 weeks, target saturations could be 91 to 95 or 90 to 94. With very tight alarm limits, we um, suggest in Europe uh, alarm limits between 89 and 95 uh, in order to avoid hyperoxemia. We are aware that this is very difficult to handle for the nurses because we know that there are fluctuations. So the nurses don't like this, but we think it's, it's very important to try to avoid fluctuations. So I will end up with thanking my close collaborators in this field. Siddhar Dramji, I've been working with for almost 30 years. He was instrumental in doing the first pilot study on air versus oxygen in newborn babies resuscitation. That was a very brave step at that time. Max Vento in Valencia also have been a collaborator for almost 30 years and he has done fundamental work in this field as you all know. Satyan Laksmin Rushima who's giving a talk in this same series here and not next time but the time after at UCS Davis, we have collaborated now for many years, and he is responsible for, for all the nice uh, <coughs> slides I could show you, uh, all the drawings. Julie Ovi from Sydney, she is a driving force for following this cohort of uh, small babies, and she's also the PI of the new torpedo trial. And Vishal Kapadia from Dallas, Texas has also contributed a lot especially for uh, regarding the, uh, the, the targets, so saturation targets after the first minutes after birth. So without these uh, very um, uh, creative colleagues, uh, I couldn't have presented this uh, uh, lecture today. So with this, I will thank you for your attention. I will be happy to try to answer questions. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you, sir, for an excellent presentation. I'm sure the delegates have enjoyed each and every word you have spoken regarding what sort of percentage of oxygen we should be using for preterm babies, initial few minutes, then slightly in after five minutes or at five minutes and in term babies. So we have uh, questions from the audience. I have tried to club most of them. And uh, some of them has already been answered in the slides during the presentation, like the one person has asked what should be the oxygen saturation of preterm baby in the initial first day of life, which you have already said is 90 to 94 percent. But sir, do we have tar different targets for preterm baby after initial first few days of life, like when they are in developing stage of BPD or they have already developed BPD? And do we have a target which are different for the babies who are suffering from HA in the initial first few days or they are suffering from PPH? Well, that's ex excellent uh, questions, and um, uh, many colleagues would say that we should change the target as the, the babies um, uh, mature, uh, and maybe we could increase the target. Um, the problem is that we don't, at, to my knowledge, we don't have uh, evidence base to answer that question, uh, we need randomized studies to test this out. And uh, as far as I know, there's no really satisfactory studies showing that. But you know that several centers in the world, they, they are changing the targets and increasing the targets as the babies mature. Um, I think that we should stick to evidence-based medicine and when we don't have evidence we should be honest and say we don't know and we should all of us we have a responsibility to to organize and carry out studies to answer such questions so that was uh, what was the second question so probably till now is it Practically, we are safe to you in using targets of 90 to 94 or 90 to 95 percent in all babies, preterm as well as term babies, irrespective of the well, disease they are suffering from. No, uh, because again, the the, the neoprom study only studied babies less than 28 weeks. We don't have data, or we don't have very good data for babies above 28 weeks, and we haven't looked at specific diagnosis you know some of the neoprem studies they looked at small for gestational ages and found that maybe they uh, need a little bit more oxygen but you know in the so i think the support trial showed that but when they did a, a lumping all the data together there was no difference a significant difference for for small for gestation age babies so as far as I understand it, these data, we, we, we are not able at, at this time to differentiate too much. Maybe no. some people will disagree with me in that, but that's how I interpret the data. Clubbing another question with this is that in congenital heart disease, that uh, the saturation usually those babies are having is around 70% or 65% yeah. 70%. Why we want to target those babies, they are they are fine with the saturation of 75 and 80 percent also so why we yeah. are targeting higher saturations <laughs> in pphn well um pphn um well first of all of course um the neoprom studies uh, didn't include uh, babies with uh, congenital heart uh, defects and that's a completely different uh, condition um but um uh, I mean, uh, if the question was that we should uh, target preterm babies uh, to 70%, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Uh, I don't know if we know the consequence of that. Um, so, um, but, it, but it clearly, I mean, uh, uh, babies with cardiac anomalies, uh, 
clearly show that uh, a newborn baby is able to compensate and can survive with hypoxemia for a long time. Uh, when it comes to PPA10, it's a, a different uh, situation. And I think that uh, Satyan Laksman Rushama is talking about that uh, in his seminar to you. So, and I think uh, I will leave the question for him when he comes. Sir, Dr. Kabra, sir. So can you please ask the, the next question? So very wonderful presentation, sir. We thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and the uh, you. newer aspects. One of the question uh, that uh, is there is that Elcor suggests that room air should be used for gestation, which is greater than 35 weeks. Yeah. What should be the gestation cutoff for using room air in your opinion? Would you like to go down even further? Yeah, I think, uh, to be honest, I think that uh, the, the most recent ILCOR recommendations are confusing. If you go back to the 2010 recommendations, they said clearly that term or near-term infants down to 32 weeks should be started with air. And the reason for that is that if you, if you look at, we, we did a, a subgroup analysis over our meta-analysis and show that preterm babies, we had preterm babies to approximately 31, 32 weeks uh, in some of our studies. And we show that even for these, there was a reduced mortality uh, if you start with air. So that's the reason we have said babies above 31 weeks start with air. And, and now uh, Ilkor says that babies under 35 weeks don't start with hyperoxia and babies 32 weeks uh, or less than 32 weeks start with air or 30% oxygen. I think they're, I think they're a little bit confusing uh, the ILCOR recommendation at, at this uh, point. Um, so um, I, you know, if you look at, at our recommendations, we don't distinguish between 35 and 32 weeks. We could say babies above 32 weeks and above start with air. I think we have data which can support such um, a conclusion. Thank you, sir. Um, other question for you is like, uh, we universally are resuscitating full-term babies with room air. Yeah. Uh, why not do that for preterm babies when we resuscitate even with uh, oxygen, say 30%, 25%, the risk of hyperoxia is higher than the risk of hypoxia. A question from one of the neonatologists is that why not start with room air and then go upwards? Yeah, that's what uh, I mean. Uh, that's what we we also thought was a good idea, and it probably is a good idea, but maybe not for the smallest babies. And uh, so when we we saw that there was a higher mortality in babies less than twenty eight weeks, starting with air, we had to change our opinion about that and uh, recommend to, to give oxygen. Uh, and I think that there is now evidence showing that these babies should not be given air. Uh, but we don't know whether 30% or 40% or 50% is the optimal. This is what we would like to answer in the, the Torpedo 3060 uh, study. Um, so, but, but uh, my opinion is that our babies less than 28 weeks, they need some oxygen. Uh, I think, that, as, as I mentioned, the, the really hot topic now is whether we should start high with these babies, 90% or 100%. And I'm concerned about uh, starting high because we know that even a very brief exposure to 90 or 100% oxygen triggers long-term effects in these babies. So until we get more data. Uh, I'm not. I will not be convinced that we should start high. We should start low. Uh, what low means can be discussed. Uh, but 30 percent, maybe 40, maybe 40 percent is better than 30 percent. We don't know. And it takes a lot of time and resources to do such studies. We have been planning the new torpedo trial for two years, and we're trying to get funding. It's not easy. I mean, it's a constant struggle in spite of the fact we think these are very vital
questions to get an answer to. Thank you, sir. Other question from one of the participants in the seminar is, how would you, uh, when, when we resuscitate the preterm babies, we give oxygen also and we give PEEP also. And PEEP. Yeah. P -E so mm. just to keep lungs recruited. In your opinion, which we need both or we just PEEP be good enough or just oxygen good enough? No, I, I completely agree. I mean, PEEP is probably the most important to... I think one of the major findings of the, the RESA2 study and other studies showing that ventilation is the most important to open the lungs and uh, that people have been trusting oxen too much uh, in the past. So I will absolutely say yes, PEEP and ventilation is the most important to open the lungs. And in most cases, that's sufficient. But in the smallest babies, I, I'm, now I'm not talking about babies with lung diseases, meconium aspiration, but with healthy lungs, uh, in most cases, we can manage this with air. Thank you, sir. I pass it on to Navi. Uh, Dr. Ramanathan has posted a comment related with the last question the sir has asked, that no one should use the static low or static high SpO2s. So should consider a graded uh, FIO2 concentration. Start with low and tighten it up in the delivery room, as Dr. Ola has also said the similar uh, answers yeah. to the previous questions. Uh, one interesting question, uh, one panelist of Bishik Singh, uh, the delegate has mm -hmm. asked that, how does maternal hyperoxia during delivery affect the newborn? Because many times obstetricians, they do give oxygen to yeah. the mother for yeah. some for one reason or the other does it change the fetomaternal circulation and the, how does the fetus handle hyperoxia during the process of delivery or just few minutes prior to the delivery yeah fortunately uh, even if the mother is given uh, hyperoxia uh, or 100 percent oxygen not so much is uh, transferred to the baby um, so it's not very efficient the uh, way to increase the oxygenation of, of uh, of the fetus. Uh, so what I think about the practice, it was a routine practice many places to give mothers 100% oxygen if there was a difficult delivery. I, <clears throat> I don't think there's any indication for that or very few indications for that. <clears throat> and I don't think the, the baby can benefit from that. Okay, so thank you. Another question is, is it more FiO2, high FiO2, or it, is it a high PO2, which damages the lungs or brain? Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, maybe both. We don't know. Uh, but I, uh, if you had asked me about the saturation or PO2, I would say the PO2. Um, and um, uh, the problem with the now, I'm not answering the question, but I'm commenting um, a related uh, uh, issue. The problem with the saturation is, of course, that we don't we don't know uh, we don't catch the peaks. I mean, and that's why we, European uh, recommendations say that we should target uh, saturation between 90 and 94, because uh, and then we have uh, the upper uh, alarm limit 95 because we know that. If the saturation is 95 or above, we don't know what the PO2 is. It could be very high, and we are not aware of that. So that is, uh, I, I'm uh, more afraid of that. But of course, uh, a high FO2 probably has a direct toxic effect as well. Another question is from Dr. Divakar. That as we know that the saturations, they get affected by the type of hemoglobin. Uh, the baby is having. So sometimes we, we need to transfuse to give transfusion to the baby and there is high percentage of adult yeah. hemoglobin at that point of time. So do yeah. we have a relatively different uh, saturation targets after giving blood transfusion to a preterm baby? Do no, we, we have don't any have... practice difference uh, yeah. you need to follow? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very relevant question uh, because we know that uh, transfused blood um, has uh, shifted the hemo hemoglobin saturation curve uh, to the right. And, uh, uh, but uh, as far as I know, uh, 
we don't have any data. And uh, I haven't seen any recommendations go into that. So that's another issue which we should study in, uh, in detail. It's difficult to get um, a larger material, I mean, to, to study that, but it's, it's a very relevant comment, I think. Uh, as we are concentrating more on you know, providing better fit facilities to the newborn in the delivery room itself, like CPAP or a blender, another question has come related with that is, what about the effect of temperature and humidification? while we yeah. give oxygen during in the delivery room itself. Effect of temperature and humidification of oxygen delivery uh, in the delivery room itself. Like we use in NICU, we use humidified oxygen during CPAP yes, yeah, ventilation. Yeah. Yeah. So if you start I, using humidification and uh, at, at a proper do, uh, temperature, body temperature oxygen during the process hmm. of resuscitation or giving oxygen in the delivery room itself, well, I, um, yeah, uh, that's a, another relevant question. Uh, I haven't seen that been studied in detail, but my um, understanding of that uh, question is that we need humidification because if you have dry air or, or if you have cold air into lung, it, it injures the lungs. So whether it affects the oxygenation, I, I don't know but it protects the lungs uh, to uh, give humidified uh, air or oxygen uh, and also to have a, keep it warm body temperature. Another interesting question, sir. What is the physiology between oxygenation and epiglottic opening? Is there any role of giving caffeine in the antenatal period just before the delivery of a Baby, because we know that the caffeine we now now it is try to use it as early as possible as soon as the baby is born and we have IV light in place we try to give caffeine for the better effects on the lungs yeah. as well as the brain. Yeah, I don't know how it affects uh, the glottis opening. Um, I know that, uh, for instance, with the Lisa method, uh, caffeine is used uh, uh, quite freely, and. Um, the last time I discussed this with Angela Krebs from Köln, I asked her if this was evidence-based. Is there any studies uh, uh, randomizing babies to early or late caffeine? And I don't think there are uh, that, but I know that uh, I think most, most uh, who practice LISA are giving caffeine in the delivery room. Is, is that what you would yeah, uh, that, 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 is there any antenatal role of giving caffeine and in the antenatal period, just before the delivery to the mother? Is there any trial? Uh, is there any data on this? Yeah, there was a trial many, many years ago in, in some cases where they gave um, uh, they gave caffeine to, but it was not a controlled trial as far as I remember. So uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't give caffeine before we had. Uh, a really good uh, randomized trial showing it has effect and, and be sure it hasn't uh, too many adverse effects. So I, I, I can't recommend that before we have uh, evidence-based. So there is no good data. evidence to recommend As far that. as I know, it, yeah. there, are, there are not. So, but uh, you know, there are so many studies. I, I I'm not, <laughs> so it could be studies I haven't uh, aware of, but um, I think all such answers to such questions should be based on on uh, evidence based studies sir what should be the ideal timing for cord clamping for preterm as well as the term babies uh well that's a big question you know and we're now talking about physiological cord clamping and uh, but you know if you look at uh, guidelines uh, you will see that most guidelines recommend to wait 30 to 60 seconds. I was uh, myself part of uh, the last um, guidelines that came out from the WHO on, uh, on newborn restation. We, we recommended 60 seconds for term babies. Um, but today we talk more about physiological cord clamping. It means that we want the babies to have taken the first breath before we clamp the cord. So we're not so occupied with the, the timing 
<clears throat> and uh, so it has it's been shown that if you if you practice a physiological cord clamping, you get a more, much smoother transition with heart rate and blood pressure. Thank you, sir. Sir, Dr. Kagra, do you have questions? Well, there is a very interesting question for you, sir. Uh, this is regarding now for preterm babies, we have oxygen saturation target charts that we aim to achieve. But when you planned your studies and collaborated with many centers, uh, this was obviously earlier than 2007 when these charts came. And then what were you actually targeting both time? So can you share your own experience like, you know, and what were your thoughts behind that? And suppose you get another chance to do it, would you do like we are doing now, uh, targeting uh, pulse oximetry saturations? Uh, so I'm not sure I, I, I caught the question. So you asked... Uh... So the, Which, the question is like, you know, in your studies, when we were resuscitating babies with room air and oxygen, yeah, what were we targeting to see the child is responding? I mean, when we did our first studies, we didn't have any targets. Uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't have uh, pulse oximeters in the delivery room because we did this in the 90s. Yeah. So, um, uh, so the only uh, what we had built in, in our first protocols was that babies who uh, stayed cyanotic uh, uh, and didn't change within 90 seconds were switched from air to oxygen. So that's what we had in our protocols. You know, um, to uh, monitor pulse oximetry to do saturation monitoring in the delivery room, I think that started around 2004, five, six, maybe. Um, so uh, many of these uh, recitation studies had been carried out already. Okay, sir. So another question is from Dr. Karthik Nagesh from Bangalore. So his question is intermittent hypoxia it's a problem we encounter very frequently in uh, babies who are less than one kilo. Yeah. What oxygen target would suggest, you would suggest, and would you have any data on long-term outcomes for these babies who are having these intermittent desaturations? So that yeah, is one question. And then yeah. part of it, the second part is, uh, any uh, thoughts on NIRS and cerebral tissue oxygenation in these situations? Well, to, to, to answer this question about um, intermittent hypoxia or hypoxemia, this has been studied uh, in detail, uh, especially uh, in the support trial. And it seems that, no, I, I didn't show you the data. I don't, don't have them exact at hand, but um, everybody can find them. And, and I think the, the bottom line is that we, we want to, uh, avoid uh, fluctuations, both hyperoxic and hyper, hypo, hypoxic uh, swings. We want to make it as smooth as possible uh, because it's shown that those who has, have more fluctuations are at increased risk of, for instance, ROP. So, and, and what was the second? Role of NIRS and cerebral oxygenation in this kind of situation when you are having intermittent uh, desaturations. Yeah, so uh, whether we should use uh, NIRS, uh, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it was discussed now recently whether it's time to use this now routinely in the, in the delivery room. I don't know if we have enough data for that, uh, but uh, I'm sure, I mean, we have been discussing that for years. Uh, should we uh, should we start to use uh, NIRS also in the delivery room? And I'm I'm quite sure, uh, convinced that there are uh, conditions that there are patients that would benefit from such uh, measurements. But whether we should use it routinely, I don't know. I mean. Uh, I guess most uh, NICUs in the world don't have access to NIRS. Uh, at least we don't have that in, in, uh, in my unit yet. Thank you, sir. Uh, one question for you, and it's 
basically you told how did you get the idea of doing room air versus oxygen, xanthine, hypoxanthines. But when you actually planned this study, what were the difficulties that you faced? How easy, how difficult was to convince everybody around you to get involved? Uh -huh. And how did you actually persuade people to get involved into the research that was core to your heart? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, well, I have to say that we met a lot of resistance. And uh, people uh, thought we were crazy. People shouted at me after meetings. Uh, fortunately, I got in contact with Siddharth Dramji, And he was very brave. He also met resistance when he did his first study in, in Delhi. Um, but there are a lot of skepticism to this because, uh, uh, yeah, as you know, 100% oxygen had been the rule for 200 years, more or less. Um, so um, it was an interesting process, let me uh, say that, and to see how, how it was uh, difficult to convince people but then when we got the data, uh, I think the, the international uh, neonatal community changed quickly. And we had a lot of support also from early on. Some of the pioneers, for instance, Mary Ellen Avery, she stood up at, uh, at uh, Hot Topics meeting uh, and supported the idea, which was very important for, for me personally to, to know that Mary Ellen Avery supported this. So I could have written a book about that. And I, in fact, I have written a book about it, <laughs> but unfortunately it's only in, uh, in Norwegian so far. Thank you, sir. Naveen? Yeah, I, we have tried to club the most of the questions and, uh, and yeah, there should be targets, yes. Mm. Is there any different saturation targets for SGA babies? Do we have any data? Uh, yeah, there, there was um, some of the, the data that came out from the support uh, trial in the US indicated, as I mentioned, that SGA babies would need more oxygen than uh, appropriate, appropriate for gestation age babies. Um, so for a while, uh, I and others, we suggested that they should be in the, uh, maybe in the upper uh, uh, level of uh, oxygenation. But when they lump together all the data from the, the other Neoprom studies, uh, the difference between SGA babies and, uh, and the other uh, disappeared. So uh, we cannot give any specific recommendation for SGA babies. But if you ask me how I would practice it, if I had a severely growth retarded babies, I would not exceed the target, but I will be more careful to keep the babies maybe in the upper part of the target. But that's not uh, evidence-based. It's just my personal opinion. One last okay. question before we uh, decide to wind up. Yeah. The yes. commentary that appears in the guidelines of American Academy of Pediatrics, the first conclusion that they make, even after we are working, uh, the whole world is working from 1940s on oxygen and its effect on mortality, retinopathy, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, NAC, is that the ideal physiologic target range of oxygen saturation for infants who are extremely low birth weight is likely to be patient specific and dynamic and depends on various factors, including gestational age, chronologic age, underlying disease, and transfusion status. Yeah. So, so what is your comment on this guideline? Well, I think that uh, what we all uh, hope for and uh, uh, would like to see happen was that we could individualize every baby 
that we when we the, the factors you mentioned and we could maybe put it into a kind of a, a nomogram and 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 get some uh, very personalized uh, um, saturation targets for each baby it could be different from one baby to the other and in the future we also according to not only gestation age but chronological age as you mentioned and and maybe gender uh, so that is at least my goal that we can personalize um, oxygenation and i think we have achieved a little bit but uh, i think the questions uh, after my lecture has demonstrated that we have still a long way to go and i uh, have to I, I'm realizing that these questions will not be sold, not all these questions will be sold in my lifetime, at least not in my active time. Uh, so I've been working on this for 40 years and, and I will hope that many young uh, colleagues out there could be interested in this topic and understand it's important to do studies uh, because there's so many unanswered questions in this field. So I, I wish that you, the next generation, can kind of continue this work and, and so we can answer these questions. Thank you, sir. I'll pass on the proceedings to Manoj to give a vote of thanks and close the session. You, you were wonderful, sir. You were just wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for your attention. Thank you for all the great questions. Uh, many of them are very difficult. And thank you for the chairpersons. Friends, all the good things have to come to an end. So uh, may I request uh, uh, Dr. Vishnu Mohan, our secretary of NNF Kerala, to propose official vote of thanks before we wind up today's session. But this is only the beginning. Uh, please join us for the next 15 months. This is going to be a series. Dr. Vishnu. Good evening, all. On uh, behalf of the IAP Neo Chap, NNF Kerala, IAP Trishur, and the organizing team of IAP Neocon 2021, it's my pleasure to thank our respected speaker, Professor Dr. Ola Sockster, for inaugurating our webinar series, the Learn, Learn from the Legends, and for that wonderful talk. Thank you, sir, for being up with us today. I thank thank you. Dr. Nandakishore Kabra and Dr. Naveen Bajaj, the chairperson and secretary of IAP NeoChair, for the constant support and for moderating the session today. Thank you, sir. I thank, I thank uh, uh, and we are honored to have the presence of Dr. Satin Lakshmi Narasimha and Dr. Rangasamy Ramanathan, two more legends in neonatology among the panelists today. And I thank all our 1,350 delegates. We had delegates from 24 countries attending our webinar today. Uh, many of them attending on Zoom and many on the YouTube channel. Last but not the least, I thank my team, the organizing team of IEP Neocon 2021 for all the hard work in the background. Thank you all. And I would like to invite you all for our next session of Learn from the Legends webinar series on 7th of July. A talk by another legendary speaker in Dr. Peter Davies on delivery room management, evidence, and future perspectives at 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time on July 7th. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.